Live from Santa Monica, California, it is the show that is always trying to expand its horizons. And today we are doing a special live episode with my dear friend, Jody Weber. Uh, we are going to discuss all things Long Island uh, Lisk, Long Island serial killer, Ryan Koberger, all things in the true crime world. She's going to bring us up to speed. Um, but this is our first Friday live ever, so I'm really excited to see how this does. And uh, welcome to the channel. I'm Collier Landry. This is Moving Past Trauma. Let's get into it. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial. In when I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. This podcast serves as a type of therapy and reconciliation for myself. And it is my hope that it helps anyone who has experienced deception, betrayal, and dark trauma. I'm Collier Landry, and this is Moving Past Trauma. Mover Nation, what's going on? Happy Friday, August, I was going to say July, August 4th, 2023. I have a fan favorite of the show. Jody Weber is joining the program today. We're going to discuss all things true crime wrap up for the week. Uh, we had some big news today in the Long Island serial killer case. Uh, there was a big press conference. She's going to talk a little bit about that. You know her. She is a former FBI agent with over 22 years of experience. And now she is the host of the hit true crime podcast, Caught in My Web, exclusively on Patreon. She's back here on a Friday afternoon and evening to share with us what is going on in the world of true crime and what is caught in her web this week. Please welcome friend of the show, Jody Weber. Hi, Collier. How are you? Hi, I'm well. Thanks for having me back. So I was, just to be honest, I was uh, scolded before we got into this because I tried to trick you into getting a headshot yes, yes, uh, to yes. use for the thumbnail. So I, and we, you said, have you learned nothing from the Barbie movie? That's right. And I taught you a lesson, didn't I? Yes, you did. Yes, you did. But uh, thank you for humoring me. I forgive you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I'm allowed one mistake. That's well, yeah. That's it. You're done for life. I'm done for life. I'm done for life. But uh, so there's been some. So thank you for coming back. Look, oh, everybody loves welcome. you here. And, thank you for uh, having me back. Your subscribers, the movers, are the nicest people. Mover Nation is the nicest people. And then they get caught in your web. And then it's just all all these like little uh, euphemisms we can use, and it's really fun. <laughs> well, and they they're so nice, and they reach out, and I'm so happy to have them check out my podcast. So thank you very much, Mover Nation. I really appreciate your support. That is a absolutely wonderful. So, uh, so there's been some big news. So why don't you tell us what's like literally what's going on in the world of true crime this week week and what is caught in your web well i will not be singing it i will tell you that because you don't want to hear me sing but i will tell you today today the big news was this press conference this morning 10 30 eastern time from those officials who are running the gilgo prosecution against rex Hairman. um they have identified jane doe number seven her remains were found first in 1996 on Fire Island, which is a long, long island on that Ocean Boulevard um, roadway, pretty much to the east, towards the Atlantic Ocean. Part of her was found in 1996 on Fire Island. And then in 2011, almost 15 years later, another section of her remains was found in Nassau County. That's the furthest west. And Gilgo Beach is right in smack in the middle in between these two locations. So investigators and authorities were able through their investigation to link the fact that the remains found in 1996 were compatible with the remains found in 2011 and were actually from the same victim. Then with the assistance of the FBI, they conducted genetic genealogy. We're hearing a lot about that. And they were able to build family trees and identify potentially the family that this individual was from. And then through a DNA swab that was 
contributed by a relative, they were able to determine that Jane Doe number seven is actually a woman by the name of Karen Vergata. She was 34 years of age when she disappeared in on Valentine's Day, February 14th, 1996. She was a sex worker living in Manhattan. And ultimately, this is good news for her family, the fact that she has been identified. No charges have been filed at this time. They have not linked her killing definitively to Rex Harriman, but investigation is continuing. And so it is good that the fact that she had been identified all these years, 27 years, it is a good thing that she's finally been identified and that her family knows of her whereabouts, that there can be some sort of hopefully investigation and prosecution for her killing and that answers can be sought. Here I am trying to push buttons here. Um, I pulled up a so map that I was going to share with everyone that we can check out because, uh, yeah, there was a um, there just just for everyone logistically because you're explaining this to me and I'm thinking to myself, I don't really know where any of this takes place at all. So the Gilgo Four were pretty much centered around Gilgo Beach, which is center location of all the locations where victims' remains have been found. But the torso part of this victim found on Fire, Fire Island um, back in 1996. Um, Actually, I should correct that. The, the remains that were found on Fire Island in 1996, those were the easternmost remains, um, cl close to the remains found of an infant and near Jessica Taylor. Uh, it was finding Jessica Taylor's remains that really prompted investigators to look more in this area and towards Nassau County. And then that's when they found the second half of the remains of Karen Vergata. Interesting. So you're saying that there is no connection at this time to Rex Hoyerman? Nothing that's been announced. But when we look at the patterns, this, she was a sex worker, the location of the remains, uh, the fact that there are similarities amongst the victims, I think it would be it would not be smart to consider that Rex Harriman started in his 40s. Very few serial killers start their killings in their 40s. Given the fact that this victim was killed in 1996, he would have been about 32 years of age. So I think it's possible. I don't think there's anything that we can look at to eliminate him as a possibility. So one of the things that I, when I was listening to the news this morning, they were saying that uh, that there could be potential copycats. So that might be a reason why it might not be connected to him. That is correct. That is correct. However, remember, they didn't find these bodies until 2010, 2011. So the fact that there were some dumped as far as 1990, far back as 1996, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Um, I I think it's possible. This is, you know, there's remote areas there where these remains were not discovered for several years. So it's not that it's heavily populated or transversed or, you know, have a lot of foot traffic, that sort of thing when you think of a beachway, you know. Um, but it's possible, but I wouldn't eliminate the fact that law enforcement, they're looking, they're looking at everything they collected from Rex Harriman, and they're looking to see, is there DNA from any of these individuals? Are there trophies? Are there souvenirs? Are there things where we can put him in a location? They're going to recreate the victimology now of Karen Vergata. They're going to look at where she lived. They're going to go back and try to trace her activities and her, um, you know, what was her routine and then see if it intersected with his. My understanding is she was from Midtown Manhattan. That's where his architectural firm was. So all those kinds of things have to be looked at and explored. Certainly, like I said, they can't say, or at least they have not said definitively, they have found a connection, 
but they're looking for one. You better believe they're looking for one. And not only with this victim, but with the other victims as well, because ultimately they need to see, first of all, who are these victims? There are still other victims that are unidentified, but then they need to look at the fact that we're looking, we're seeing multiple sex workers here that have their, their murders have not been charged. In addition now to Karen Vergata, we've got Jessica Taylor. Um, we've got um, another um, victim whose name is escaping me right now, but I'll think of it. Um, and then there's another, there was um, a, a male who was actually dressed in women's clothing. There are a lot of people who speculate that he was also in the sex worker industry and mistaken as a small stature female. And of course, we know the Gilgo Four were very small statured women. They were tiny. They were approximately 100 pounds, four foot 10 to five feet tall. There was another victim named Peaches. Peaches' identity has not been um, revealed or identified to date. Given the fact that her toddler was also found, there's many who believe she was also in the sex worker industry and had brought her child to her client, to meet with her client. So we don't know for sure, but those are things that are being investigated. Yeah, and here is the, here is the map to sort of lay it all out for everyone. Just to... That's so a good map. That's a pretty good map, right? I just, yes. I, I just pulled it up and converted it, and here we are. I feel like a very professional operation here. We're getting there. Oh, right? you've got it, Collier. You've got it. What do you need uh, a headshot for when you got this? Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so, um, okay, so how many victims in total are there? There are 11 victims that have been found along Long Island. Now, they're not sure about Shannon, who was the first one, Shannon Gilbert, yeah. who was the one who, who instigated the search to begin with. Um, she was the, actually the last victim found in December of 2011, but she was what instigated the search in the first place. And so they're not sure. Law enforcement has said that they believe she may have accidentally drowned may have been an accident. I'm not necessarily convinced of that. I'm not writing that in pen. I'm still penciling that in as a possibility, I guess you could say. I want to see what comes out of the searches of not only Rex Harriman's home, but his vehicle, of its storage lockers. I think all of these victims deserve to be um, considered a possibility to be prey of his. It's really chilling to think about. It really is. And, you know, I had subscribers reach out to me today who couldn't believe that his wife had gotten so upset over the fact that her home was torn up. And they were like, well, why is she so upset about her home when she's married to a man who's, you know, murdering women? And the way I explained it to my subscriber is you have to remember that these family members, the wife and the children, they're in an incredible state of shock. And so the easiest thing to get mad about or upset about is a home that's been disturbed and turned upside down. That's the easiest thing. The fact that she was married to a man that she really didn't know, the fact that he has a violent nature, violent tendencies, it's very much like the stages of grief where you're in complete denial at first, and then you're sad, and then you get angry, and then Finally, you reach a stage of acceptance. But right now, I think this is so fresh for this wife of Rex Harriman. She's got two children she has to think about. And when you think about when a, a loved one or a family member dies and you go away for the funeral, and then it's so exhausting and it's so emotionally taxing that you just can't wait to get home and just collapsing in the comfort of your home and relax and unwind. Well, they can't do that because of what was done in their home. No. And so I think we really need to give her and those children a little bit of grace. Yeah, I'm really glad that you brought this up because I was <laughs> I was watching a, a video and I think it was News Nation. They were talking about her and you know, they, of course, got the, like, the worst picture imaginable they, they, they could show. Right. Of her just like you know, this face of just because she's outside her home. There's probably a bajillion photographers and people harassing her law enforcement, obviously. And 
the, the, some of these people that were interviewed, and I don't know who they are. One was like a criminal uh, handwriting analysis person or something or, or behavioral analysis person. And I thought, okay, you know, they were, they were just really being very hard on her. And I've seen these people on there before on this channel and I've, and they've always been very quick to be like, well, this person, this, you don't know until you're in that situation. And well, exactly. And she's probably, she, her one child has special needs. The daughter worked with her father. I mean, this not only has affected her home life, it's affected her work life. Um, you know, you have to think they're looking around, thinking back to, was everything a lie? They're thinking back to what they were told when he called home and said, uh, I'll be home late for work. I have to go such and such a place. They're questioning everything right now. Um, so I think, you know, they probably, in my experience, are probably experiencing some sort of post-traumatic stress just from being notified of this, being informed of this, hearing the details that are coming out on news coverage. I think we really need to be careful with them because we don't want them to, to self-harm or, you know, to do anything that um, they shouldn't be blamed for his actions, I guess what, what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, Absolutely. it is it is very common, and I've seen it in a number of cases I had while in the FBI, especially with siblings who just were shocked at some of the things that, that their brothers or sisters had done. And they just had such a hard time comprehending. They're like, look, we had a good upbringing. We had loving parents. We had a roof over our head. We have college educations. How could this happen? Well, you know, I think part of that is just you know, the denial and the shock, but then people get mad. It's like, why would you do this to our family name? Why would you disrespect us? Why would you embarrass us? How could you be so cruel? We have certain values. We have certain morals. We have certain faiths. You know, it, it's just such a slap in the face, not only legally, but um, to the family name, to your reputation, to your ethics, to your values, to your religion. It's a lot. It's a lot to take on all at once. You know, uh, Tara Newell and I interviewed on our first episode of Survivor Squad. We interviewed a woman named Jennifer Faison, and she did the podcast mm -hmm. Betrayal. And then that show just came out as well. Same name. And one of the things that she talked about is when her husband Spence was arrested for this, you know, the search warrant was served on their home for this underage relationship that he had had, and which is just insane. But uh, then she started unraveling all of these other extramarital affairs, not intentionally just trying to sort everything out for her husband and going through his Facebook to try to find this just, to, to find evidence that he's not guilty. Right. Mm -hmm. And then all of this came ca cascading down with all these numerous affairs with multiple women in the way that she was so blindsided. And I think that people need to think about if they've been in a relationship where they were cheated on, right. Or, or whether it be a, you know, a marriage or it just be a boyfriend, girlfriend situation or whatever, or betrayed in some matter, you just are going through your mind back and forth, replaying every single incident. And this is a 25 year relationship they were in. That's right. This isn't just, you know, a blink of the eye kind of relationship. And just like with cheaters, you know, most cheaters, they've got the WhatsApp, they've got the signal. They're not calling on their regular phone line. They're not texting on their regular text feed. They're using apps and they're disguising it. Well, serial killers disguise things too. And they're good at it. They get good, just like cheaters get good. Well, yeah, my father was really good at it. Well, yes, that's a perfect example, Collier. He was good at it. And, you know, your mom put up with it for so long. You wonder, what did this woman know? Did she know that, okay, he had a dalliance with a sex worker in the past? Had she discovered that, but didn't know that there were homicides occurring as well? I mean, you wonder if she knew, did she, did they have the sort of, you know, some marriages are open that way, where for whatever reason, one person becomes asexual or not sexually active anymore. And they give passes or hall passes, so to speak. And they say, okay, you can fulfill your needs that way, 
but you know, you're not going to run off and have an ongoing emotional affair. It's just a physical paid for engagement. There are people that do that. That is part of their marriage. So we don't know exactly what the parameters of their relationship were, but certainly based on everything that has come out from law enforcement, she had no idea that her husband was engaged in the alleged or the, the violence that he has been accused of. Yeah, I initially thought when I first found out about her, you know, and people were obviously, of course, speculating rampantly online, but I mm -hmm. thought she probably, if she thought anything, she probably thought he was having an affair. And he could have even come clean to her and said, hey, I did have this little mm -hmm. little tryst with a, with, a, with a sex worker, and, you know, I, I slipped up, and I'm really sorry, and that could have been where it was left. And so she, you know, said, okay, that happened, and that's how he explained maybe something away or maybe she found something that could be considered evidence or whatever, and that could have just explained it away for her, it, or she was suspicious the whole time. But I to think that you're in a relationship with someone who's doing that, I don't think that's even something that entered her mind. Well, and even, you know, I know women who say it's the emotional affair that's much more traumatic to them than the physical affair. You know, the physical affair, it's just like a body with pulse. But when it's, you know, the long surreptitious phone calls and texting and letters and gifts and really the emotional crutch when men cheat, that's what really devastates women. The fact that they emotionally bond with another woman outside the marriage. Some women don't blink an eye if a husband has a dalliance or two with a sex worker. It, to them, it's like, okay, whatever. You know, if that's what you need to do, you can do that as long as you don't emotionally cheat on me. So we just brought up a really good point. Uh, one of the channel members was wondering, do most serial killers have a wife or a family? Is that Well, many do. Many do. Um, you look at Gary Ridgway had one. BTK had one. BTK, he was a deacon in his church. You know, so, I mean, there are several that do. Um, you know, Ted Bundy was not married at the time of most of his killings, but he certainly had a live-in girlfriend with a child for many, many years. So there are men who are able to comp compartmentalize and um, do sustain long-term relationships. Yeah, somebody else said uh, they have a family member that, was, that got divorced and age 83 discovered that the partner had led a double life with another family. And I, I have a friend that mm -hmm. had that happen to her. They had a, lives here in Los Angeles. She's a beautiful woman, makeup artist, very professional. Found out her husband had a whole other family in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That happens, absolutely. Or you have um, spouses who cheat and then they will engage with, um, you know, someone outside of the marriage. And then that person begins to extort them for money to keep quiet. And so you'll find spouses who will pay off their blackmailer for years and years and years. And sometimes it can take spouses, you know, quite a significant amount of time before they catch on. Like, you know, why, why do we only have this balance in our savings account? Where is this money going? And so, you know, cheating spouses can be very crafty. They can disguise what they're doing. And certainly with technology and all the different apps, you don't need a burner phone anymore. You can talk to a lover or a mistress on the same phone just using a different app. And it's very easy to disguise. Which, you know, I, don't, I think people don't realize like how yeah, you don't need a burner phone. Mm -hmm. You don't need, it's very, very, like with WhatsApp and all these other services, it's. Mm -hmm. <sighs> and, you know, I would tell both men and women that if your spouse has WhatsApp and you also have WhatsApp, you can see when they are online on WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. And so if they say, oh, I'm going downstairs to watch the football game. And then you look on your WhatsApp, you can see if they're online. You can see if they're in the same house on that app without your knowledge. So uh -oh. just a little food That's for interesting, there. you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I mean, I don't, I have friends that are big WhatsAppers. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. use it very often. I'm very terrible at checking because people are like, I sent you a message on WhatsApp and I was like, why? 
Well, I, I deal with international, international people. International. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah. But, um, you know, just something that, you know, something I saw in my cases quite frequently, WhatsApp and Signal being utilized for cheating. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's uh, the cell phone, right? It's a, the, it's a blessing and a curse in technology in general. Uh, speaking of technology, so there was a pretty big, now in the Koberger case, switching yes. gears a little bit, we discussed last time there was the alibi, but you weren't sure what it was or they were talking about, they were alluding to something. So mm -hmm. something else happened with that this week, correct? That's correct. So where we le last left off, the last time I was on is there was a game of alibi chicken, I like to call it, where Ann Taylor, the lead defense counsel for Brian Coberter, was saying to the prosecution as a response to their alibi demand, yes, he's got an alibi, but we're not going to tell you what it is. But it may come out through cross-examination of prosecution witnesses and perhaps through uh, expert testimony. Well, the prosecution wasn't having it, so they cited Idaho statute saying that okay if you have an alibi you're provide you are obligated to provide us with witness names specific location address location because let's say okay you're saying this guy was in this proximity well where in this proximity we want to know the address of where in this proximity because we may have video from that home or a nearby home to prove yes he was there or no he wasn't we want specifics and we're entitled to it under statutory law well then ann taylor filed her response last night and it was very much um an objection to the state's objection is basically how it was titled and she said while brian cobra has the right to maintain his silence until when and if he chooses to testify at trial she understands that yes prosecution is correct that is what state law says about providing an alibi you have to provide if you have specific witnesses and a location and so the alibi that ann taylor coughed up this time is that brian koberger was out driving around alone now that kind of plays right into the hand of the prosecution because they allege, yes, Brian Koberger left his residence in Washington and drove to the proximity of the crime scene. And then he parked his Elantra. And then we have the Elantra going on that circuitous route from the crime scene for an hour and 10 minutes before it finally loops south and then goes back into Washington and then goes back to his residence. And then the most damaging thing we know is that that phone was turned into airplane mode during the time that prosecutors believe the murders took place. So yes, prosecutors say yes, he was driving around and thank you for confirming that Ann Taylor. Now, what she's going to claim is that yes, he was driving around. So all these 12 instances where you say that he was driving around, that's what I told you, he likes to drive around. Prove he was in the residence. That's what she's getting at. And the prosecution is saying, well, you're saying he's driving around. Where was he driving around at? And she puts in her filing, I can't give you specific locations at specific times, but certainly I will be cross-examining your state witnesses. And that may elicit testimony as to where he was at specific times in his car. So ultimately, I mean, when you look at it in totality, the circumstantial evidence of the Elantra matched with the tracking of the phone records, matched with the fact that his DNA is in the residence. A lot of defense attorneys say, well, it's just touch DNA. It's still his DNA and it's on a knife sheath in the crime scene where four stabbings took place. When you have that with the fact that he doesn't have an alibi putting him anywhere else, and like I said, most significantly, the fact that his phone was turned to airplane mode during the time that they believe the homicides were committed, that's very strong in totality. Oh yeah, so I guess I thought the purpose of an alibi was like, hey, I saw John at the, at the McDonald's at 8.15 a.m., so he could have been there. At well, that is traditionally what it is. <laughs> and she, she puts that in her in her filing that traditionally that's what people think. But Brian Koberger likes to drive around alone. And I think, quite frankly, one of the key things in her filing is the fact she states 
he was alone. There's been a lot of this conspiracy theory, online speculation that maybe he wasn't alone. Maybe he had somebody else in the car. Maybe he was just a passenger and somebody else was the person who committed. Well, she came right out and said he was alone. That's big. Yeah, that is big. That helps the prosecution. It really does. It really does. Because if she he wasn't alone, then she needed to provide his alibi with him, who was with him, that can say he didn't do this crime. Well, she doesn't have a, a person's name to tell because there was nobody with him. So he was alone. So uh, I think that's very significant for the prosecution. Now, coming up, August 18th, that is a huge day in this case. There are huge things that are going to be handled, pretrial motions in court. Specifically, the defense wants the indictment tossed out. They are claiming that the grand jury was not properly instructed. So therefore, because the grand jury wasn't properly instructed and they were instructed with the threshold at the probable cause level instead of beyond a reasonable doubt the defense wants the entire indictment thrown out and they want brian koberger remanded to a preliminary hearing now i believe we will see within probably the next few days the prosecution coming back and rebutting that filing and saying no judge here's why you need to consider this a legitimate grand jury indictment and they were properly instructed so we're going to see a lot of back and forth on that and then ultimately we can hear oral arguments about that on august 18th additionally the defense is going to be challenging the investigative genetic genealogy on august 18th they want those family trees that were utilized to construct um basically the family lineage that was utilized to identify Brian Koberger as a suspect. And to date, the prosecution has said, you're not entitled to that under law. So that's another thing that the judge will have to work through. And the judge is judge, judge, right? Yes, judge, judge. I, I, I don't want to say judge squared, but it is, it's judge John judge. So yeah, that's, it's quite a mouthful to say. Tri triple J. We'll just call yes. it triple J. Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's wow. The airplane mode thing is yes. very interesting. Well, it's not very smart for a guy who's getting his PhD in criminology. I got to say, in my experience, criminals either turn their phone off completely or they leave it at home or another location switching it to airplane mode 20 minutes before you commit a crime and then switching it on 20 minutes after a crime not smart i mean that really raises questions about what were you doing why is this switch to airplane mode um you know it doesn't look good so i think that is going to be that's going to be hard for the defense to get around. I think, quite frankly, I think that is the thing that works against him the most. That and the DNA on the knife sheath. Although the defense will argue that it's touch DNA. He could have touched that at a store or at a trademark. And, you know, they can argue that, of course. But I think, you know, finding some sort of plausible reason why he would switch that phone off. If he would have just left that phone at home on his bedside table... He would have been much better off, um, you know, and, and left it on. I, I, you know, I, I don't think um, if you're going to commit the perfect crime, that was the perfect thing to do, because quite frankly, it's very incriminating. The fact that that phone went off just prior to the murders and then went back on shortly thereafter. So I think um, that will be a big point that the prosecution makes. Yeah, because I remember back to the Murdoch trial, too. There was a whole thing where obviously his cell phone played a big part in that locating where he was. But then he left it somewhere intentionally. Right. That he was left the it whole... back up at the house, which and... is very common. Usually that's what criminals do. They leave it somewhere else. They'll leave it in the car or they'll leave it at home or they won't. Oh, I forgot my phone kind of thing. Well, Think about it. How often do people really forget their phones? Very rarely, very rarely. Pretty much, I mean, even if women who carry purses, they don't even carry their phone in their purse that often. Often it's in their hands. Yeah. Pretty much everyone carries their phone in their hands. So juries don't really tend to buy that excuse much more. 
uh, or that often that people forget their phones because we're just, we're all glued to our phones 24 seven. We just are. It is a problem. It is a problem. Mm -hmm. So can the phone be tracked when it's in airplane mode as well? My understanding is not as much, I think, and I'm certainly not an expert on this, but yeah, sure. I do think that there will be, they will be able to measure the strength of the signal off that phone just prior to being turned into airplane mode and then after. Now, I'm not sure about the independent apps on the phone, that I'm not aware of if turning it to airplane mode also affects the independent apps. That's just not my wheelhouse. So I don't want to misspeak, but certainly I do think the geolocation data on that phone, both prior to the crimes and after, I think all these um, 12 or so drive-bys that have occurred prior to the homicides, I think a lot of that information will come out when we eventually get to trial. And it will be very interesting to see um, exactly how close he got to the residents and where did where did he is he alleged to have parked? I also think, quite frankly, one of the things that is most fascinating to me is if they create a geolocation timeline for Brian Koberger, as well as for the four victims, and see if his geolocation, if they lay it out like a Venn diagram with the geolocations of the four victims to see, okay, which of the four victims did he intersect with at the same locations the most often? Because he could have been stalking these women without them even knowing it. He sure. could sit in the library by them. He could sit in the same coffee shop with them. He wouldn't even necessarily need to talk to them. He could just be there. When you're on a college campus or in that kind of environment, it's not unusual to see the same people at the same locations and not think Absolutely. anything of it. So I think that may help investigators identify if one of the victims in particular was the target. That's an interesting point about the, about being able to uh, like track him at the same, I mean, mm -hmm. wow. Mm -hmm. That's... And I think they will do that. I think they will. Because oh, I for think sure. There's a lot of questions about why this location and why these victims were selected. And I think Cause... certainly there's a lot of questions about the Mad Greek and the fact that Zana and Maddie both work there and the fact he was vegan. You know, they had vegan options at that restaurant. Did he just happen to go in there one day because he was looking for something to eat that met his dietary requirements and developed a fixation? Is that what it was or was it something online? I think all of that will come out and it will be very interesting to know what was it. And then once he did decide, okay, that's this is who I'm going to target if if in fact he did he is innocent until proven guilty but let's just assume that he did target these individuals what what was the initial interest and then once that sparked an interest how often or what activity did he participate in to facilitate his obsession and to facilitate his interest and to gather his intelligence on the victims. You know, it's interesting that we're talking about this. This is something that just came up, and I've thought about it a lot, actually, discussing this particular situation, but he is a suspect. So how ethically can we talk about Because that's how you and I met, was through an ethical true crime mm -hmm. uh, meetup. How do we ethically talk about somebody? I mean, because we're talking about it as if he's perpetrated all these crimes, but where, where does that line sort of, where does it delineate in that when you're discussing these patterns. And... and I catch myself because it is easy to slide into um, talking about any perpetrator in any charged crime as if they've already been convicted. And as of today, as of this minute, Brian Koberger is innocent until proven guilty. And so right now he is the accused. He is the suspected perpetrator of these crimes. So I think that's important to remember that. And I catch myself doing it. It, it is 
hard to um, not fall into the pattern, but it is something that we all do need to remember, as well as with Rex Harriman, he is accused, he is not convicted. So I think, you know, and, and once we get details, like once probable cause affidavits are released, and once we hear prosecutors make statements in court, then, you know, we know what law enforcement has as far as evidence they've collected. So it also, um, you know, you can't, the toothpaste is a little bit out of the tube at that point, and we know more details. And so we know the fact that his phone tracked to their location, and we know the phone left that location after the homicides were believed to have been committed. And we know that phone tracked in sequence with the Elantra, and we know he drives an Elantra, and we know his DNA is one in 5.37 octillion consistent with the DNA on that snap. So, you know, it's hard when you know all that that's been put out there to remember on every occasion to say he is innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, I, um, so one of the things that I'm thinking about as well is this phone data that is out there. Mm -hmm. It seemed to be like, like just a few years ago, it was very difficult to get these, to get this data and get this data released by companies. What was there a, like a landmark case or something that happened that made this more readily available? Cause it seems like it was instantaneously available in this, in these cases. Well, we do have um, with many companies, especially with the FBI, I can't speak for state and local agencies, but certainly on task forces, I've worked with state and locals and then just independently as the FBI, we do have situations and relationships with certain companies where if we reach out and we say, look, we have a very emergency situation here where we have a very, very violent perpetrator, we have potential human life at stake, oftentimes the phone companies will prioritize our requests and give us immediate assistance trying to track a phone or help locate who's the subscriber of that phone. Things like that, um, especially with the kidnapping, that can be very, um, I mean, time sure. is of such an essence in those situations. So yes, the phone companies do tend to cooperate, especially when human life is at risk. Um, and then we do oftentimes, especially with computer companies, internet companies, um, send preservation letters so they preserve their records. And, you know, typically phone companies, they have whole departments that do nothing but deal with subpoenas from law enforcement. Because, I mean, everybody's got sense. a phone nowadays. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, somebody had asked here, Sadie B says, what is the technology call that can now point to locations within a small number of feet? And is this new? Okay, well, that would be geolocation data. And typically, I think she might be referring to a geofencing warrant, where that is relatively new. And what it is, what is, how it's being utilized is when law enforcement knows that a crime has been committed at a certain location, what they'll do is get this geofencing warrant. And that will tell law enforcement all the cell phones that are in such um, so many feet or so many yards or meters of that specific location. So let's say a one mile radius all the way around. It'll tell law enforcement, here's all the phones that are in that fence. And then here's all the subscribers to those phones. And then that gives law enforcement a pool of suspects to look at. Interesting. Well, I hope that answers that question. <laughs> I hope so too. Yeah, I, I mean, right. I think a lot of this came to prevalence also with COVID because you could start to track the, they were doing that a lot in South Korea. It was like the first big country that did that to sort of track the virus and things like that. So that's interesting. What else? So I, I saw on your, on your Twitter, what, what else is happening in the world of true crime this week? 
Well, we had a lot of developments in the Madeline Kingsbury case, the murder in Minnesota of that Mayo Clinic worker who she dropped her kids at daycare at the end of March with the father of her children and then went missing shortly thereafter. And about two months went by before her body was discovered. Well, search warrants in that case were just unsealed. And we know a lot now about the accused Adam Fravel and his activities following Madeline Kingsbury's disappearance, specifically that he was found or seen rather on video recordings on property adjacent to his parents' property near Mabel, Minnesota. The owner of 800 acres of uninhabited property had cameras located throughout his property. And that's not uncommon in Minnesota, Wisconsin, where I'm from. A lot of hunters have cameras up. Well, this particular landowner had trail cameras up and was able to observe Adam Fravel on a sports utility vehicle out on his property with a shovel. And so law enforcement was able to seize that sport utility vehicle, seize the shovel, and ultimately they were able to find Madeline's body four miles from the location where he was seen on that video camera. So a lot of interesting details that came out from the unsealed search warrants as far as the history of text communications between Adam and Madeline Kingsbury, the fact that he told her that if she didn't mind him, she would end up like Gabby Petito. Um, just some shocking details there. Also, a lot of um, his behavior in the hours before before she was really became a national media story when she was first missing. He wasn't alarmed. Meanwhile, her and her friends were alarmed. Her family was alarmed. And he's like, well, I just don't understand what's the big deal. She's not even missing 24 hours yet. And then the daycare worker saying, well, he just showed up to pick up the kids. We didn't call him to come get the children. Well, how would he know to go get the children if Madeline typically picked up the children? How would he know to go get them if she's missing and he didn't know where she was and hadn't talked to her? How would he know the children would need to be picked up if the daycare didn't call him? You know, a lot of inconsistencies like that. Very interesting. Yeah, and uh, I'm very familiar with those trail cameras because we use those on three seasons of Pool Kings. And we would, okay. those things last forever. So we would leave them and we would forget because we were doing construction sites and, you know, mm -hmm. over a period of months and we for, would forget about them. They would, they would just last that long. <laughs> well, and I thought that was one They're of amazing. the, um, I thought that was one of the big mistakes that Alec Murdoch made. You know, he had that huge property down there in South Carolina and they did extensive hunting on that property It had numerous cameras. And when asked about his cameras after the murders, he didn't seem all that interested in, locate or telling law enforcement where to go to get the footage and it's like well yeah. if you really thought there was a perpetrator who had just murdered your wife and son wouldn't you tell them hey there could be somebody hiding on my property go check my cameras i thought that was very i i almost thought the prosecution didn't exploit that enough the fact that he didn't care about what could be seen on those cameras well i mean it's very telling though right yes yes yeah <laughs> Uh, also was very telling is we sort of, well, we saw the end to at least this chapter of the Lori Vallow trial. That's the right. Sentencing. The sentencing. Yes. Um, oh, Collier. It was heart wrenching. It was heart wrenching. And I have to say the sister of Tammy Daybell, Samantha Gwilliam, she gave one of the most impactful impact statements I have ever heard at a trial. She really laid it out, all the lies that Lori and Chad had told. And the fact that, you know, she's like, look, we have been alienated from the grandchildren, from our nieces and nephews, Tammy's children. You have conspired with Chad to spread all these fantasies and about being zombies and the end of the world and dark people and dark spirits. She's like, we are not dark. We are not zombies. These are my sister's children who I helped raise. 
And now my mother died a few months ago and her entire funeral was marred because Tammy's children are afraid to even talk to us because they're afraid of losing their other parent. I mean, the alienation that's being fostered, it's just so heart-wrenching and so sickening after the fact that they've already lost Tammy. Now they've lost these five kids because these kids appear to be aligning with Chad which makes you wonder what is their mental health like? Do they believe in all these zombies and the apocalypse and the end of the world? What is their mental yeah. state? I really, really worry about that. Yeah, I think that I was surprised she spoke at the sentencing hearing, but... Yes, and then Kay Woodcock spoke, um, and then statements were read from Lori Bellow, Daybell's son, Colby, yep. and then Tammy Daybell's father. A statement was also read on his behalf, and then Lori spoke, and yeah. she got up there. I don't know how that those family members didn't scream at her. I mean, she kept saying... Well, JJ and Tylee, they're very busy up in heaven. And they told me, Mom, you did nothing wrong. And we know you loved us. Her children, Tylee was dismembered. JJ was smothered. And she kept saying, but they're very busy. They're very busy. Ugh. What? And then she kept talking about Tammy that Daybell. Like, my friend Tammy, my friend Tammy. If I was Tammy's family, I would have lost it. I would have lost it. I think the thing that was so was just so crazy. She starts it off <clears throat> and she says how, uh, you, you know, children get sick or like describing that there was some affliction that these children have and that's why they, they passed away. I mean, it was just, I, I couldn't believe what I was listening. I think everybody reacted that way. Like, could you believe mm -hmm. what you were listening to from this person well, in, in the, and, and the condescension in that, you know, well, I'm on the spirit level and I talk to angels. Well, the angels never told you that when your children were murdered and buried in a pet cemetery that you shouldn't have been collecting social security benefits for them for months afterward. The angels didn't tell you that part. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't like people who weaponize religion. And it, it was just, you know, it was like spitting in the face of these family members who were just devastated yes. over what was done to Tammy and then to these children. And, you know, I mean, we have Chad's trial coming up next April. Um, one of the attorneys that is a subscriber to my podcast, she just got notice down in Arizona that they've begun extradition of Lori down to Arizona for the wow. two attempted murders or the, the murder of Charles Vallow down in Arizona and then the attempted murder of Brandon Boudreaux, her niece, niece Melanie's husband. So uh, we'll have that trial to go through too. And, you know, there was no remorse. And I did think Judge Boyce really handled his commentary uh, quite well. I think he called it out, you know, to her, like, you have not accepted responsibility. You have shown no remorse. And it's just to think that a mother could do that to, to her own children. It's just heartbreaking. I just, I think everybody was just sick, just felt sick. And she said that she mourns with us. I also mourn. I, I just, I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't. Well, and I don't believe she's mentally ill. I think she's faking it. I think it's an act because let me tell you, she didn't have any problem knowing what to do when it took lining up all the financial crimes. And I work complex financial crimes for years. Yeah, yeah. I know that takes a lot of methodology, um, exactness, conscious intent. She had conscious intent. She knew exactly what she needed to do to get the money that, was going to those children. She knew exactly what to do. Yeah, she knew she knew what mm -hmm. she was doing. Yeah, I just I just couldn't believe the 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 hubris, the the overwhelming arrogance of her just to then it, it just felt like she was just establishing herself as I know more and I'm better than the rest of you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and again, weaponizing religion as if she's some yes. superior being. Yeah. It's very, it's very chilling too. It, it really is. It's very chilling because let's face it, 
she was on podcasts spouting off all that stuff about the apocalypse and the 144,000 and the end of the world and dark spirits and zombies. There are people that listen that think, yes, that's a possibility. Yeah. That's totally rational. And they're out driving around on your streets and going to your grocery stores and, you know, in your schools and going to your PTA meetings. That to me is frightening. Yeah. It's, all, it's also sad to, to weaponize religion in such a way that, Oh, because then people look sad. at it, and they go, oh, everybody's a religious nut. And it's like, that's not true. <laughs> you know? Well, and I have friends that are Mormon that were particularly concerned when this trial was going on, that they don't want people to look down on the Mormon religion, thinking that they think people are zombies and they think the end of the world is coming. I mean, some of my Mormon friends, quite frankly, are the nicest people I've ever met in my life. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, they would do anything to help people and are so... Um, you know, almost, I would say the most ethical and moral people I've met. And they were very, very disturbed by that trial because of what was portrayed and that they didn't want their religion uh, misunderstood by the masses. Which unfortunately is what was starting to happen. So um, ugh, just what a week, right? A lot, Collier, a lot. What Definitely. a what a week. Uh, Jody Weber, thank you so much for joining the program. Where can my audience find you? You can find me on Patreon. My podcast is called Caught in My Web. You can check out my website, jodineweber.com. I'm on Twitter at Jodine Weber and Instagram at Weber Jodine. I will have all of the links to Jody's uh, podcast and her, her website and all of her uh, uh, handles for social media in the show notes of today's episode. Jody Weber, thank you so much for joining the program. Thank you, Collier. Thanks for having me back. Really You're enjoying welcome. Mover Nation. <laughs> thank you so much. Happy Friday. Have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Take care. Thank you all so much to my channel members, my channel supporters. Thank you all uh, to my Patreon subscribers. And please check out Jody's podcast caught in my web again links will be in the show notes of today's episode i want to say thank you all for joining me on a friday friday evening uh friday afternoon here in los angeles uh for another live i'm going to try to do more of these and i'm just excited that you guys can join me for this on that note i'm collier landry and this is moving past trauma thanks y'all This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. For exclusive content around this podcast, please consider supporting me via Patreon by going to collierlandry.com forward slash support. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. And please leave us a five-star review. If you want to see video episodes of this podcast, please check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash collierlandry. You can find links to additional resources in the show notes of today's episode. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio. Copyright, Collier Landry.